In the late 1950s, William Phillips noticed a correlation between unemployment and inflation. And I have a picture of this gentleman right over here, Irving Fisher, because he actually noticed that relationship a few decades before. But the relationship has taken on Phillips's name, really because his publication kind of captured people's imagination. And the relationship is not that surprising. It seems to fall a little bit out of common sense, but we'll talk about examples that seem to go against this relationship. If I were to plot, if I were to plot the unemployment percentage right over here, unemployment, unemployment percentage on my horizontal axis, and I plot inflation on my vertical axis, so let me put inflation here, inflation on my vertical axis. Then he noticed, and I'm just going to pick random data points, that if but in one year where there was high inflation, there was low unemployment. And then in another year where there was high unemployment, there was low inflation. And it's not clear which one is causing which, or maybe they both circle back on each other. And then in other years, maybe where you had medium, medium inflation or relatively low, you had relatively low unemployment. And so he looked at a bunch of years and plotted them on an axis like this. So let me do them all in the same color. So you take a bunch of years and you plot them here. So now you have higher inflation, slightly higher employment, unemployment than that year over there. And I could just keep plotting, keep plotting some points over here. You could even have deflation. And what he saw is there's a correlation here. That there's an inverse relationship. That if you were to try to fit a curve to these points, and you could have more points here, and I'm just picking them at random, you could fit a curve that looks something like this. You could fit a curve that looks something like this. That is generally saying that when you have high inflation, so that's up here. So when you up here you have high inflation, low unemployment, high inflation, and low unemployment, low unemployment, unemployment, which is the low unemployment part is a good thing. And out here, and out here you have low inflation, low inflation, and high unemployment. High, and if this curve goes below the horizontal axis, you could actually have deflation. High, high unemployment. And it makes, I think, reasonable sense. We've, we've kind of talked about it in common sense terms before. But you could imagine, and once again, it's not clear which one's causing which, but you could imagine in a world, just reasoning through it, that if you have low unemployment, or you could view that as high employment, low unemployment, one way to view low unemployment is that you have high utilization of the labor market. Well, now in this situation, workers have more leverage. Workers, workers have, have more leverage. And if workers have more leverage, then employers will, want, will have to increase wages to attract and retain employers. So they have more leverage and they have more options. There are a lot of people looking to hire them. Employers, so let me think of it from the employers. Employers, employers raise wages, raise wages to attract and retain employees. Attract and retain employees. But of course, when you increase wages, you are increasing buying power, generally for workers. So this is this is increasing workers' buying power, increasing increasing buying power, which would increase their demand. So this is going to increase their demand for goods and services. And if they're increasing the demand for goods and services, it's going to increase the utilization of all of the factors of production, of land, of capital, of entrepreneurship, and of labor. And so that's going to lower unemployment even more. And you could imagine, if you already have low unemployment, or, and this is just one of the factors of production, but if you think about all the factors of production, they're probably all highly utilized. The factories are running at close to full capacity. You're, the, the labor market is running at full capacity. If you increase buying power and you increase demand in that context, so demand is going up, demand is going up, lower unemployment, Capacity utilization, or I guess you say labor utilization, is going down. There's less capacity, more demand. This is going to cause prices to go up. So this is going to cause prices generally, prices to go up. And then if prices go up, now workers have leverage and options when there's low unemployment, but they also have higher costs. 
So then we'll also say workers have higher costs. Higher cost of living. Cost of living. And this is a very kind of hand wavy diagram, but it's just to make you think about the overlong dynamics. And so workers have more options and leverage. They also have a higher cost of living. The whole, the whole economy is kind of uh, uh, operating at close to full tilt. And so they're going to demand higher wages even more. And then this thing can keep cycling and keep cycling. Now, this seems a bit common sense, but there are exceptions to these. In the 1970s, the United States experienced stagflation, and that's kind of the worst of both worlds. That's high inflation and high unemployment. So that is right over here. And things that could cause it, and in particular what people point to in the 1970s, and it's always important to realize in economics, people don't know for sure what was the exact cause, and there seldom is only one cause. But one of the things that's often pointed to is that you had a supply shock. You had a supply shock. And the supply shock was in oil. It made the cost of producing everything more expensive. And so that just drove the prices up. But it really didn't allow, it really didn't allow the country as a whole to become more productive. One way to think about it is it drove the prices up here, caused a higher cost of living right over here. But this part of this cycle that we would normally associate with low unemployment and low and high inflation was not occurring. So this part, this part right over here, this part right over here was not occurring. And because those higher prices were essentially going out of the country, you could, uh, you, you could essentially imagine that they were squeezing out people's ability to pay for other things. So this, the higher cost of the higher cost of living or the higher prices for oil, you could draw a line from either one, and I know it's getting messy now, you could imagine that it inhibited demand. It inhibited demand for domestic production. So I'll draw negative feedback right over there. So it squeezed out people's desire to buy things from the US because they had to pay so much for oil. And there's other explanations for it. Uh, when people saw the low unemployment, the government wanted to print even more money to fuel things, but it did not get this kind of virtual cycle happening. There are some arguments that there were just structural reasons why the government, why the economy couldn't adapt properly so that employees or workers and resources couldn't be allocated efficiently. But the whole point of bringing up the 1970s is to show you that this isn't a law. And it's not clear what's causing what. That there, is a, there was a situation in the 1970s where you had stagflation. And the opposite of that was what we really saw in the late 90s, where you had relatively low inflation and you had relatively low unemployment. So this is a very good situation that we had in the late 90s. And the argument that many people make why we were able to do that, why this cycle didn't keep going on and on, why the prices didn't go up, is that you had this other trend of huge techno technological improvement. You had computers and telecommunications had this, and the internet went under this, in, in, this kind of super uh, productivity curve. So even though you had the cycle, you had b an increased buying power, demand was going up, the productivity of the country was increasing so much that it did not lead to inflation. And so that's what threw us there in the late 90s. So in general, it's a neat thing to think about. It's, it's, it's to, at least to some degree, it seems like common sense. But like in all things in economics, it's always a little bit more nuanced and complicated than just some little, you know, some correlation that, that you might observe. This could be generally true, but there's always going to be exceptions to it.